You're about to join Jerry Parker, Marit Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Jerry Parker, Marit Siebert, and I, Niels Kostrup Larsen, are excited to be back with you on this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series, which is our weekly ongoing raw exploration exploration of the world of rule-based investing and of course where we also take some of your questions so good morning jerry and good afternoon to you moritz hello Niels. good morning now there were some big gains in energy uh, markets this week uh, we had a continued recovery in equities and a big drop in the price of vix that was some of the highlights from this week probably not exactly what trend follows was uh, positioned for, um, but we'll find out uh, in a little while. Um, but before we do that, I want to give a big shout out to two people who have been helping us uh, both sound better, but also are trying to make it easier for you, the listener, to find out uh, exactly what you want in each of these uh, episodes. Um, so the first shout out goes out to our producer, Dimitri, who flew to Switzerland this week and spent two days setting up some new technology as well as fine-tuning the soundproofing uh, in the little studio that I'm in. So I really appreciate this, uh, Dimitri, and I hope uh, the listeners that you do as well. And uh, Nothing more important than good sound on a podcast. But I also want to give a shout out to George, who not only have contributed with some great questions uh, in the last few weeks, but he's also now providing us with a quote-unquote a minute marker for each episode that I'm trying to figure out how to publish so that you, the listener, again, can see roughly where in the episodes we're dealing with certain elements. And hopefully that will also uh, make it a little bit easier for you. So Dimitri and George, from all of us, thank you so much. We really do appreciate your efforts. Now, with that said, let's jump into our regular schedule here and find out what played out for us in the systematic investment world this week. So why don't we uh, start with you, Moritz, as usual. Um, let's see what went on in uh, your portfolio this week, um, and uh, we'll take it from there. Well, maybe I guess this week uh, I would have preferred somebody else to start because there isn't very much uh, positive to report as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's been it's been a bad week, a bad start to the year, really, because I'm still short the equity indices. I think, with the exception of one Asian market, um, I'm short across the board. And that cost cost money uh, this past week, um, and it was so much. Uh, you know, I had some gains from the bonds, the JGBs, and the boons, but that hasn't been that much to cover the equity losses. And also, uh, I have a short position across the energy spectrum, so WTI, Brent heating oil, gas oil, gasoline, and uh, those have all been um, losing positions in this past week. As far as the currencies are concerned, um, um, well, losers actually a bit um, still along the dollar um, against uh, most of the other major currencies. Um, not that much of a, a major move in that in that sector, but uh, it has produced losses. So there we go, um, around minus five to minus six negative for the month, which is obviously also in the year-to-date performance. Uh, would have liked that to be different, but it is what it is. It certainly is what it is, and uh, I mean, obviously, we saw similar, uh, you know, similar tendencies in the in the portfolio. Maybe not uh, hit quite as bad um, uh, on our side, um, but clearly, there's been some some interesting uh, market moves, um, as I was saying in the introduction, which is you know a little bit against uh, the trends that were starting to establish. Uh, you know, clearly the uh, energy bounce uh, was against the short positions that uh, most trend followers, including us, have started to initiate. Uh, although I do think that uh, maybe natural gas actually um, that also went up. I see, so um, so that would have helped a little bit, um, but um, clearly also uh, some of the um, bounces in equities uh, hurt us, and some of the uh, fixed income positions um, were tricky. Um, so all in all, uh, no, I mean, not, not the greatest start to the year, nothing too dramatic, I would say. Um, and, um, and frankly, you know, there are 
certainly is a, a, a big chance that what we're looking at right now is is some corrections, um, you know, against the prevailing trend. So this may all change, um, you know, in a few days or weeks. So we will we'll see. But now, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Not nothing dramatic to report, um, but still um, continuing this environment where trend following has been uh, challenged uh, for sure. It could be different those uh, in the uh, individual stock uh, selection that you do, Jerry. How how do you uh, how do you see the last week or so? I see it in quite differently. It's everything that, uh, as I mentioned last week, uh, all the little bells and whistles that I think uh, make us who we are and maybe we like about ourselves that are different from other people. Uh, they all caused us to lose money last year and underperform. And this week, uh, they turned around. So we good week for not being uh, but short for many stocks or energy. Uh, and I sort of sidestep those uh, due to my measurement of excessive volatility in those markets. Um, so I was not feeling good about that until this week. So not too bad. And of course, the most important thing about stocks is to be long some stocks this week. So as I've been saying, we not only were not short very many indices due to the fall, but we were still long. So that was painful until uh, this week in the recent uh, period where the stocks have rallied. Although I, I think I'm like you guys, I don't really hold out much hope for these rallies or I'm not feeling so great about them, but uh, you know, it's uh, you know it's most just most important to stick to whatever systems and rules you have, and uh, so it worked out for me this week. And 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 I think also actually it is important um, when we have these discussions um, just just to point out the fact that you, you know trend following isn't just one thing, and and clearly from our conversation today, but also on previous conversations, it it's very clear that uh, even though we all practice trend following we get different results at different times. Um, and I think um, sometimes, at least I've come across people who are of the opinion that, well, trend following, I just need to pick one. And I really don't think that is right. I mean, trend following, you know, can be many things. And and even within trend following, you probably need to, if you're an investor allocating to external funds, you probably need to allocate uh, across um, a few to to um, get a slightly smoother return profile than than just sticking with with one manager. So, sorry to interrupt you, Jerry. Just wanted to flag that. That's right. Uh, you know, different markets, different uh, time holding periods. Um, it's going to create some differences. Uh, we get negative feedback. You know, we people in the summer uh, we're doing better. People celebrate our differences uh, in the in the fourth quarter. You know, we get redemptions and criticism because uh, people want to be short the stocks. And so uh, you just have to roll with it. Yeah, no, absolutely. If there is nothing else really to um, to report from, from this week, let's move uh, swiftly on to uh, sort of the next uh, thing we, we try and, and, and bring up. And that is just to see how the social media world was... Uh, uh, reacting to some of the um, tweets uh, out there in particular. Um, so I'm curious to know, Jerry, what uh, what got a lot of attention, a lot of uh, love perhaps from uh, from your followers and, and the Twitter, Twitter world in general? I guess the most uh, popular this week was a tweet of an article that showed performance of a portfolio as you add more CTA trend following managed futures and of course, I wouldn't have tweeted it if it hadn't been a positive. So uh, obviously, um, it goes like this. Trend following contributes to smoother returns over time. When added to a traditional portfolio, performance stabilizes and achieves higher risk-adjusted returns. It seems to have the most positive effect when allocating 20 to 50% of the portfolio to it. And it was a nice chart and some numbers that uh, supposedly proves all of that over a long period of time, probably not recent uh, past few years, but sure. I mean, our strategy is <clears throat> has lots of markets, longs and shorts. It's going to be hard to keep that out of the portfolio and make it a material part. 
especially if you give, give it enough time and include years where we actually did pretty well and stocks might have done poorly. So I uh, got a retweet from Meb Faber as well, which was, uh, or yeah, retweet and a comment, uh, which was nice. This is a good question to ask most evidence-based investors. Do you include trend-following strategies? If not, why not? So a lot of comments on that. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll just just a quick comment on both. First of all, the the article we were or you were referring to uh, was um, something that Derek uh, Notman I think had been working on, but I know also uh, Mike uh, Milicinas uh, had been involved with some of the content, and and Mike Covell actually I think was also involved. Anyway, nicely put together. Um, nothing new. I mean, again, these are the same arguments that we've been making uh, in this industry for for decades. Um, um, but sometimes it's just nice to see it laid out uh, in you know in a in a slightly different way. And uh, I did notice it got a lot of attention, um, and uh, which is great. And um, and the other thing uh, that you said about you know evidence based investors, as far as I'm aware. And I did actually bring this up uh, in an interview I did earlier this week with Andrew Lowe, the professor at MIT, who definitely is one of the, uh, you know, really authorities uh, in in this space. Um, whether or not there had ever been a white paper written, uh, so any evidence at all that uh, adding trend following to a portfolio of stocks and bonds doesn't help. And um, he didn't. He didn't. Say, he didn't point out that there had been such a white paper. So I'm still of the belief that it has never been disproven. And that's why I think Mip Faber's question, uh, very nicely put, short and succinct. Um, you know, uh, if people in, if people believe in evidence, um, you know, w- what's your argument for not including trend following in your portfolio? You're very quiet today, Moritz. Um, digesting the early the early ski trip we heard about before we got live here. Yeah, I am um, digesting the early ski trip this morning, which was great. We have a, a lot of snow here in the northern parts of the Alp, um, Alps. I'm sure down where you are, Niels, uh, the same is true. Indeed, just an amazing winter. Yeah, so far so good. Um, but yeah, I've been um, traveling this past week, so I saw a couple of the tweets um, which uh, Jerry tweeted. Um, but didn't have a lot of a uh, lot of time on on the social media this this past week. So I'll I'll hear you guys out and follow along. <laughs> so I think uh, one of the comments on uh, this <clears throat> retweet uh, by Meb was uh, kind of funny. It was like, uh, is there such a thing as non evidence based investing? <laughs> and I think uh, the term evidence based, uh, you know, we're evidence based, is kind of uh, absurd and a little bit. Uh, conceded uh because i think uh the people on social media who use it they pretty much it's what they mean by that is uh buy and hold index indexing and um i have tweeted before that they're not really that interested it seems to me most of us are not this is another psychological paper i'm sure we're not really that interested in other people's evidence as much as we're interested in what we determine is the correct evidence. So throwing that term around, it means very little. In fact, it kind of means the opposite uh, of what we mean it to be. It's uh, the evidence is no one can beat the market. Uh, Owning 500 stocks in the S&P 500 is the way to go. That is the evidence. So yeah, none of us are out here saying, um, I have no evidence for what I'm doing. So it's kind of silly. But uh, because I, like I said, I was at an evidence-based conference that was the title of it, and MEP was there and said the same thing in the audience, <clears throat> you know, big audience in New York City in a hotel. Um, and if it was a true evidence-based conference, I would have had to stop the conference right there, 20 to 50 percent to CTAs. Oh, my gosh. It's either incredibly false or it's the most unusual evidence I have ever heard. Uh, but of course, it was ignored, and uh, we went on to something else. I mean, the exciting news about all of this is that I think actually that MIP will be joining our little uh, trio here for uh, for one of the episodes coming up, maybe in February. Uh, we're trying to uh, work that out. But that's going to be exciting, and clearly something we're going to 
I'm sure talk to who, uh, him about and uh, and his findings. So uh, yeah, that's yeah. great. We're looking forward to that. Absolutely, absolutely. So keep the questions coming, um, even if it's something that uh, could be used for a later episode uh, with with uh, with Mep. Uh, that's perfectly fine. But we do appreciate all the questions coming in. Back to you, Jerry. What else happened in the, in social media land, so to speak? I was on fire this week. It was a lot of quantity. I don't know how much quality it was, but for some reason, I have some slow weeks, and this was an incredibly uh, busy week. I was really excited by all the things I was reading, uh, but uh, this one kind of went unnoticed. But uh, to change the pace, we'll go with something that no one really liked, maybe except me. <laughs> uh, this was a study done and put in us. Uh, I got the original paper and the article. And it basically says that um, the more information we get <clears throat> does not improve our accuracy in our decision making, but it does increase our confidence. When we come into possession of more seemingly relevant information, our belief that we are making the right decision can be emboldened, even if there is no justification to, for this shift in confidence levels. And I think that feeds into our idea that, hey, let's just follow the price and uh, diversify and the best information is the price and we don't want to get too far away from that and the trends that uh, that are created in the markets are about as good as it's going to get especially from a risk control point of view yeah yeah i think that's 100 percent true you could think about you know let's add some fundamental information other statistical information to a trend following trading system there you have it it's more information you feel better about that more information must mean a better system but that's just not true that's that's a a mind trap there what about back prices as good as it gets sure and what about back test i mean could we say that could we say that for example doing back tests is not necessarily just about trying to find the best version of what we do because we know that there is no such thing as the best version but it is about building confidence in what we do that's right i i said i think off air last week uh the trend following systems are very jealous they do not enjoy or appreciate anything being added to them <laughs> and sort of what i meant by that was mm -hmm. they're all dependent upon this trade sample size and so whenever we're adding different things to them we could be seemingly increasing our accuracy, definitely increasing our confidence, but reducing the trade sample size. Uh, so I think that is my objection to trend following plus anything. And over the years, I, you know, we, it's kind of handy for us to adopt this idea, I guess, because where it's probably would be very difficult for us to analyze the fundamentals of uh, the interest rate markets or the commodity markets. and uh, But when I started trading single stocks in the portfolio, I would mention this to my friends who were trend followers. And almost everyone would also suggest uh, about how wonderful it would be to add other types of quantitative information. There's just so much information out there that you can supplement with the trend. And of course, I was like, no, 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 this is not... Uh, something I have any intention of doing. I'm trading all these markets with the same systems, the same trend only. And I have offended uh, clients and uh, potential clients with that statement because uh, it was sort of like, okay, it's fine if you, you weird guys are using trend and numbers to manage uh, the, your trades in these other markets, but now you're stepping on my toes. And my background, my PhD, my MBA was heavily involved in how to value stocks and traditional valuation methods. And so it's very offensive sometimes to think, sit back and tell people, well, all I need to do is just follow these trends. Yeah, mm -hmm. very true. We've got questions, but before we go to those, I just want to make sure we cover all of the um, tweets out there. I thought there were some tweets uh, from AQR as well uh, this week that may have been um, part of our exchanges or maybe not maybe um did you pick up any any of their new uh comments or research well there was this guy which i i can maybe that's why i'm thinking of it i mean there's this guy i think he, he works at nomura that keeps saying that 
oh, if the market does this, then all the trend followers are going to cover their positions and we're going to, have to see a change in in trend. And, and, and I know that Cliff Asness has been out, um, you know, uh, also talking about, you know, these these predictions of, of systematic models and, and their influence in the markets and, you know, where's the evidence of all of that. But this guy seems to have a small following, according to Bloomberg, um, and and making this. But I just want to certainly, from my point of view, say I don't think that that has much merit. I don't think you can predict where generally trend followers will be, um, you know, super active. And it sounds very simplistic to say, oh, if it hits twenty five sixty four, you're going to see a big change in what trend followers are doing. I don't think it's that simple. So, I would just caution about uh, people falling into that trap. Anything else, Jerry, on your side? Oh, <clears throat> I like uh, one more that I think it's worth talking about. Um, I've been kind of a new Twitter friend. I really like this guy. He is, seems very smart. I don't know him, but I really like what he says. And uh, so much of this um, paying attention to Twitter and tweeting and retweeting is just the same concepts over and over, maybe except <clears throat> said in a certain way that, I've never heard before or reminding me of something I believe in and like uh, that I hadn't thought of in a while. But um, this one I thought was pretty good. Um, quantitative risk management is, a, is an ironic effort. In hopes of controlling for uncertainty, practitioners calculate boundaries and measures with the highest possible precision. But the best risk management allows for wide imprecision as preparation for unbounded and unknowns. And I thought that this was particularly interesting because we, we do get questions often of, can you please uh, answer this very detailed question? Or can you please give me some detailed answers on where I should buy and where I should sell? And how much should this market or sector be weighted? And all of these precise uh, questions, uh, <clears throat> Uh, maybe in hopes that if we just pr improved a little bit, we could have fewer drawdowns or no drawdowns and life would be a lot better. And I think I think when you trade price only and trend in a medium to long-term fashion and with lots of markets, currencies, commodities, stocks, bonds, long, short, you're 90% there. You may not have it exactly right. Your leverage is a huge choice trade small, when you lose, trade even smaller. And these broad concepts that we keep talking about, I think they're much more important to focus in on than listening to anyone who uh, says I require, it sort of requires you to adopt all of the specific parameters and ideas that any of us might have. Like we've said before, it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. Those trend following systems, they, uh, they need some room you can't be too detailed on any of those entries and exits and try to laser point them. Um, there's always going to be room and uh, you know that the results and the robustness of the system. If you had it too detailed, too granular, too smooth, you'll, uh, you, you'll regret that at the end of the day. Yeah, and which is also why there's, you know, there's some uh, level of dispersion between uh, seemingly similar uh, systems. Um, and um, so you need to be aware. And as I said earlier on, you need to most likely diversify a little bit across um, these um, types of strategies. Um, one manager may, may be enough, but um, two or three. Um, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Have two or three of the medium to longer term trend following guys in the portfolio. And then maybe even better supplement that with um, a short term CTA. They had a you know, not too bad year. In 2018 <clears throat> so that's that's a great portfolio right there yeah. good ready for some questions or do you want to hear any more no let's, let's do, questions. do questions okay got a few different ones so the first one is um i don't see your name but i see your twitter handle cr capital um so i appreciate the comment and question um I think this is something, and I mentioned that in, in my reply, that uh, we probably have talked about this uh, already in one of the earlier episodes, but I know you're relatively new to, to this particular series, so we will just briefly touch upon it again. But uh, essentially, the question goes to um, an article in Barron's where um, Harding at Winton 
uh, was essentially talking about his retreat, um, or at least partial retreat from trend following in his main fund. And, um, and Sierra Capital was interested in our views and thoughts. Um, and I'm happy to, to, to kick that off. Um, from my point of view, clearly David Harding is a very smart guy. Um, I had the privilege of interviewing him a couple of years ago. And, um, and so one should always pay attention to uh, what he says. Um, however, in this situation, I think the decision to, to uh, reduce trend following, uh, personally, I, I feel that it's more of a commercial decision, uh, meaning that if you're trying to do trend following, but you also want to manage 35 or 50 billion, I think it can be a challenge, uh, even, in, even if you trade the most liquid markets in the world. And the reason I say that is I think that why trend following works well a big portion of that comes from the market diversification you get. And clearly, if you're trading $35, $40 billion, uh, there are going to be markets that won't pay, uh, play a very big role in, in your portfolio, such as some of the commodities. And that takes away diversification. It takes away opportunities. And, and over the long term, I believe it takes away performance. Um, so I understand why it might be a challenge to generate um, you know, above average return from a trend following portfolio at that size. So I think from my point of view, I think it's a commercial decision. I'm sure it's the right decision for, for Winton. Um, but I don't think it reflects on the opportunity set in trend following as a strategy. Um, I think it'll continue to perform well. It won't perform every year. Um, as we, as we know, it never has. Um, so I think it will continue to have its usual profile, um, being frustrating to be involved in at, at many times, but also delivering um, at the time you most uh, need it. So those are my views. Uh, Moritz, love to hear what you think. And Jerry, of course. Yeah, I think what you're saying uh, could be true. Uh, I think we cannot say that it is true. Um, not sure if it is a commercial decision only. I may have information uh, and, you know, come to conclusions that, uh, we haven't had a chance to look at or consider, um, and, and that's fair enough. I mean, I can only um, make decisions based on the data that I can myself have a look at. I, I cannot, you know, uh, turn off my trend following trading system just because somebody else who's very successful trading it or has been very successful trading it is doing it. Um, I need to, you know, come to that conclusion uh, for me, for Moritz. So, um I always, I, I, get, I get intrigued when I hear things like that. I don't want to say, I don't want to just wipe it off the table and say, oh, that's uh, commercially driven and, um, you know, he needs to set up his firm in a different way because, well, I just don't know that. I don't live and work inside his firm. So um, whenever those things come up, I kind of like have that, have that, you know, at the front of my mind and go like, well, Let's see, let's, you know, check things and uh, monitor how things go on, you know, what's happening in the markets, market impact, liquidity, those type of things. Have a test of some of the more like naive or easy, don't want to say naive, naive is the wrong word, but easier, well-known trading systems like 200-day moving average, golden cross, crossover, see how those have worked. And if there's anything that, you know, leads to a, a solid conclusion that uh, returns are deteriorating. Now... Just speaking for myself, I'm not at that point. I am not at the point where I can say that what what I'm trading and the way and the style that I'm trading has, even though we know we've all made losses in the past year, uh, all three of us, and, and, and the start of this year was bad too. But, you know, still, that is all within the normal behavior of that system. It's still far, far away from... Uh, from the point where I would, would even think about turning it off. So, um, you know, I just need to look at through my own set with my own set of eyes. Yeah, sure. Any thoughts, Jerry? Yes, I agree with all that. And probably the most important is how successful they've been. And so I leave it up to them and trust them for their, on how to handle their trading and their business. Uh, and I would just say that it's, it's a, I think it should be a goal for everyone to add something other than trend following uh, or add things that are sort of trend following or different than your best. Uh, certainly for, it looks like I could have used some of that last year 
maybe some suboptimal ideas that um, would maybe over the long run not really be as good or maybe not even make money, but would complement uh, the trend following or the trend following the way that I do it. I think that's a pretty good idea. I've tried to do that over the years to not just uh, focus on the best, but uh, maybe a C minus or a D plus idea or system can be added in if it's different enough. So even if trend following uh, is not doing underperforming or if it's uh, if it's performing great, or if you think it in the future, that it's going to be amazingly great, uh, our style of diversified trend following would be perfectly reasonable to add in a few things I'd, that are different or somewhat different. I would caution against, of course, uh, taking small profits with the potential for large losses, uh, the opposite profile of what we do that seems to get certain people in trouble frequently. Sure. Absolutely. So thanks again for, for the question. And now um, over to a question that came from Bill. Um, Bill has a very uh, specific question regarding uh, positions uh, during a trend. Uh, I'm just going to read all the questions and then we can comment on them uh, at once. And one is to whether or not we add to our positions during a trend. Um, it says, do you add less of the original position or the same amount? up to how many units, when do you start adding, do you scale out, um, and then uh, a few nice comments about the podcast. So thanks for that, Bill. Um, should we do it reverse order, Jerry? <laughs> Why didn't you start with this one? So I, I have multiple entries and multiple exits, different systems. It may look like I'm adding into the trend because uh, I'm not doing them all at the same time and I'm not going to by lower prices, uh, average down. So I guess I'm adding to the trend in a predetermined way, uh, systematic, and most importantly, not based on the profit in the trade from the other entries. So it's, you know, the 50 day high, then let's buy some more at the 60 day high and let's buy some more at the 70 day high, something like that. I don't use those parameters, but, uh, I think that's a pretty good idea. And, tr and usually you're buying less each time as this trend keeps going because only because your, your uh, calculation of your volatility is probably uh, getting higher each time as the trend kind of speeds up out of consolidation, let's hope, and keeps going to the moon. The, the volatility uh, tends to increase a little. Yeah, absolutely. But I guess it also means then that you're you would be quote unquote scaling out, meaning as as the stops relative to each or relating to each of these sub systems are hit, you would reduce your position accordingly. That's right. Moritz, anything differently on your side? Very, very similar. Uh, doing it essentially in the same way. Um, every time I uh, I have an entry. The position size is again a function of, in my case, the average true range of the past X days. Um, and sometimes like, you know, if it's not coming out of consolidation as Jerry has just described, and you have a longer term trend, say in the equities, and you have a late entry, a very long term entry, then uh, that may actually be one of the largest positions you add to the portfolio because uh, sometimes the volatility and the trend has been so smooth that, um, that it is a large position that you're adding there. Um, so I'm I'm agnostic uh, to that, and then you know the same is true on the uh, on the exits, multiple exits, dispersed over time, uh, as a function of where I got yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely. In many ways, uh, Bill, we do the same thing. Um, you know, we have multiple uh, entry um, systems or parameters that makes it uh, essentially uh, that it takes us a number of confirmations to get to a full position. On top of that, maybe a little bit differently from, from Moritz and Jerry, um, we would also adjust our positions uh, during the trade um, based on changes in volatility. Um, so maybe that's the only difference that I can sort of uh, mainly um, identify. But other than that, great question. Hope that is uh, helpful. Um, then we have uh, a question from George. George, that I mentioned 
earlier. So uh, so we appreciate yet another question from you, George, and all the other stuff I mentioned. Um, so let me identify. There's a little bit uh, of a comment as well. Let me identify the actual question. Um, well, let me just go over this. Um, you've all discussed the virtues of medium to long-term trend systems relative to short-term systems. Long-term equals better. Seemingly, this is based on research and experience. At the same time, you all believe in robustness, not having excessive faith in backtests, and that the future may look marginally like, or may only look marginally like the past. You also said short-term systems work well in the 70s and 80s, and we could stress, we could um, revert to a time like that. Given all of the above, shouldn't a robust system include some short-term trend-following systems as part of the whole? If not, how is it different than keeping a market that is consistently uh, losing money over time uh, in real or backtest mode in the portfolio under the expectation that it has an equal likelihood of producing profit in the future? Thanks for that question, George. Um, anyone want to kick that off or... Otherwise, I'm happy to. Oh, you go first. Okay. So from our point of view, George, we we don't restrict our model to uh, look at short-term timeframes, actually. Um, we allow it to go down to as much as a, or as little as a couple of weeks. Um, so we're not trying to suggest that shorter-term timeframes couldn't be profitable. Now, Anything below that, which I would really consider short term, is something that um, we look at differently, but we have not succeeded finding anything that is robust enough. But just coming back to what we're doing today, now looking at shorter time frames compared to medium to long term, um, when our model selects what parameters um, that it wants to trade in the live portfolio, we really don't see it picking anything from um, from that sort of only a couple of weeks time frame and, and, and maybe even up to a year or so because over the long run, at least the way we do trend following, it is not as profitable. It is not as robust as um, as the medium to longer term time frames. And so, so again, just to, to stress, we're not excluding them, but we're simply not finding... Um, any evidence um, that the model will will um, make the selection of these shorter term uh, time frames. Now, I don't disagree with you, and I heard Moritz say that as well earlier, that if you want to build a portfolio of um, trend-following managers, maybe you should combine uh, medium to long term with a short-term trader. Now, but, uh, but, but there aren't that many, and this is maybe part of the evidence, George, there aren't that many shorter term trading firms that have been successful for as long as the longer term uh, trend followers. Um, and maybe that is part of the the evidence. Yeah, maybe they did a bit better last year, but the SOCGEN short term traders index has not produced uh, very exciting returns uh, over time. Um, so few people are successful in my opinion, um, but the vast majority I think will be more successful in the medium to long term uh, time frame. Over to you guys. Well, I think first of all, uh, George, this is a, a fantastic question. I really like that because it is true. Like we're saying, we're dragging markets along, even if they haven't made money in many, many years. Um, then uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, one could say why you're not dragging shorter term systems along, uh, even though they haven't been profitable in many, many years. So in my case, there's um, there's uh, some short term time frames that I trade. And I just want to make the distinction. So. This is not an intraday vol breakout or anything that has to do with one to three day holding periods and pattern recognition. There are short term systematic traders out there that do that and some of them do that successfully. And I think adding them to a portfolio is a great thing to do. But as far as I think we as trend followers are concerned, kind of like the thing starts it with, you know, 20 day breakouts or something like that. So I'm, I'm not trading that time frame. I'm trading something that's a bit longer than that, but it is part of my system now. That system, um, for instance, when we had those uh, sharp reversals um, toward the end of uh, or in the, in the fourth quarter of past of the past year, 
um, that has been a, a profitable system. So it's good to have it in there, but it only has, you know, it, it has the same weight as all the others, but I'm trading many, many more of the time frames so that in aggregate, the system is medium to rather long term. And when I look at the uh, performance of that shorter term system uh, over, you know, all the, uh, all the years past, it is the worst performing system. It does provide some cushion uh, and diversification during, you know, those sharp reversals and periods of turnaround, stressful periods. Um, but uh, in, in a longer view, it produces uh, a lot of trading cost, more slippage than the other systems, and just less profitability. But you're right. So I'm dragging that one along. You just never know if it's uh, at some point, you know, going to wake up again and, you know, it becomes more, more, you know, solidly profitable. But um, as far as I can see that right now, it just isn't. Another A plus for George. Uh, great yeah. question. I like these great questions, especially when I like my answer. If I don't like my answer, I don't like them as much. So I like my answer. <laughs> Tip you off on that. Um, they can wake up. There's so many things I want to say. I'm going to blurt a lot of stuff out, but they can definitely wake up. I think that's the, in the back of my mind, they might be waking up. I think if the shorter term, medium term wakes up, um, does it mean that trend following gets a little easier? So if you think it's going to get easier, nicer, more friendly, not violent, uh, when you have a sell-off, the first kind of minor to material sell-off, hey, it's time to get out. Uh, that's great. Uh, I'd like to go back to those periods uh, versus forcing myself to trade longer term. Everyone should desire to trade as short term as possible. Uh, you know, or if you still want to, as long as you're making money, the drawdowns are smaller. Um, so I'm here to admit right now that the, I don't trade shorter term than I do because I can't find anything that works. I admire those who do, regardless if it's days, hours, or a few months where I'm looking at maybe 12 months holding period. So I'm jealous. Um, but I would say that to some degree, all the markets are all the same and the systems are not. That's really the, for me, the way I look at it is the <clears throat> problem or the strength of trend following is I'm going to use these same systems on all the markets, longs and shorts, for one reason only, and that is to get my sample size sufficient. So I'm really con convincing myself and telling myself, hey, these are all the same thing. Don't pay any attention to Swiss franc or versus corn. I know they look different. They may have different personalities. I keep hearing lots of stuff about how shorts are different than longs. Uh, so we're always going to be tempted if we look at the data too closely, uh, with too much precision, we may decide to trade the different methods for longs and shorts or different sectors and markets. So we are forced in order to get that sample size up high enough to say, hey, all these markets are the same. So when we've done our back test, long-term, short-term, medium-term, whatever the system it is, we have a good sample size. So that's why we're going to keep those markets in there uh, because what we're saying is if wheat is a loser over the past 30 years, bean oil, cocoa, I'm listing the ones I think might be losers, um, it has no comment for the future. My best expectation for the future is the average of all of the back test that includes all of the markets, my average win, my average loss, my win percentage. Now the systems, we got our data, we've got our back test, and we're looking at the different time frames, and we're saying, oh gosh, it looks like these shorter term systems are getting worse and worse. Maybe they could still even be better, and the longer term systems seem to be getting better and better. So that's the way I kind of look at it. What's the trend of the system and the time frame? Uh, and frankly, I think some of these shorter term, medium term, they, they're not looking that great. Uh, and the longer term just tends to work over all of the data. It, it, when I traded short term, I think the long term worked well. I didn't use long term, but I, it looked pretty good. And so, uh, but I do think they can wake up. That's a great way of putting it. We don't know. The shorter term were great last year. Uh, I think it did pretty well in 08. Then it probably didn't look good until uh, this year, since 08. So sorry for that long-winded answer, but uh, great topic.
Thanks again, George, for your contribution here. Um, then there's a question from Nick. Uh, Nick says, uh, love the show. I've been using um, TA for about eight years. And it took me about five years to develop a short and long-term system that I was comfortable with. But I'm always looking to improve my system. How would I know if I'm curve-fitting my systems? Moritz, can I... Right, so so just for clarity, I think you know none of us use any of the technical analysis like heads and shoulders and inverse heads and shoulders and anything like that to, to trigger a trade. Um, but so back to, I think the core of the question, how do you find out whether you've curve fit the data? Well, good indication is look at the number of parameters that you have used to specify your entries and your exits. Is that, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten parameters, probably too much already. Right. So try to keep that down. And then when you've, uh, determined, you know, what parameters you want to use, then uh, have a look at changing them. Now, this this is difficult to do because uh, you may then end up changing the parameters and kind of like you're already in that curve fitting mode at that point in time because when you try them all out and you look at, you know, how the system changes and how the behavior of the system changes, you may end up with just picking the best parameter set. That is nothing that I would recommend you do, right? But what you don't want to see is that a very marginal change of your trading parameters, your trading timeframes is going to have a material impact on the historical performance of your system. If it does, then you're very likely to have fit to found just one specific point, one specific way of working with past data uh, that has worked in the past, but is very, very unlikely to work in the future. So don't, don't overdo it in terms of number of parameters, try to keep that down. Um, try to develop a very clear philosophy and kind of like your your commandments, what it is that you want to do, like we've said before, you know, um, have, uh, have small losses, allow for large wins, um, accept the drawdown that comes with that, um, stay in positions longer term, um, don't stop them out right away, those type of things. And, um, that would probably get you off to a good track. There's no, I mean, this question comes up over and over again, time and time again. Um, I don't think there is a clear like law or guideline where you can say, well, this, this determines a curve fit system. Um, it all comes down in my view to, uh, to experience, uh, working with the data, spending a lot of time developing those systems, looking at different things, looking at it from different angles, trying things out. And um, just, you know, it's the work you have to put in the work. Uh, nobody can expect anyone to develop a great trend following trading system in just uh, one, two or three months. Um, and as a result of, you know, reading a couple of books, I think it is a multi year long term process. Um, I know, Jerry, you've been, you know, taught the rules of different, different setting there, but, it, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it, it is that process and that journey that you have to go through. I think the journey doesn't stop still in that. And you have to trade with your own money to experience it. And through all of that and the environment you're in, um, you'll gain a good understanding of what it is that you're doing and, and how to avoid the traps, including the curve fitting traps. Jerry? Um, I know that, uh, you know, you're not making money. That's a pretty good, maybe that's a good reason to think that maybe you have an issue with your system. Everyone's making money uh, in the trend following world except you. Uh, I've been there uh, many years ago. I, uh, I think we got a little off track and a little bit too many uh, parameters and uh, too much precision. And we were seeing things just in a few months worth of actual trading systems that we, that we had never seen in the data. So if you're having some experiences uh, that you've never seen before, uh, that's, that's a good, maybe something to question. Uh, once again, it gets back to your sample size to how many legitimate trades do you have? Uh, I think on the entries, you know, it's, you need to stick with, uh, 
what I would say, and versus or, you know, you want to have when this happens and this happened and this happens, I will buy. And now the problem with so many ands is that it's going to eliminate some trades, which is fine as long as it's eliminating uh, some <clears throat> bad trades, but you don't miss a trade. So I think that's the key as well. You don't want to have a, nothing more important than putting that trade on and not missing a big trend. But it's particularly uh, difficult in the sh in the exits if you have, uh, <clears throat> and I think that it's it's if you try to add uh, different exit strategies or make the market jump through some hoops uh, before you liquidate, that could be uh, a problem. But um, <clears throat> certainly, legitimately counting the the number of trades you have, you know, you have to separate the stop losses. That's a group of trades. You have to separate uh, anytime you have a different type of exit, uh, this exit or that exit or this parameter or that parameter or this parameter, uh, I'll exit, I'll exit. Well, that's three different systems essentially. So you have to uh, be dedicated to count up those trades. Yeah. I mean, I think both what Jerry and, and Marx has said um, and Nick is, 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 you know, absolutely right. I would add one thing. It's kind of a very simplistic way of looking at it. And that is, you know, if you're trying to be a trend follower and you're dealing with inherently volatile markets, I think if you end up with something that looks too smooth, um, I think that's a warning sign because I don't think you can take markets that are volatile and a lot of them and put them through some kind of uh, rule set of rules and then suddenly the volatility is gone and the equity curve you know, goes nice and smooth to the top right corner. Um, so so as, J as Jerry says, or maybe it was Moritz, I mean, if it could, looks too good to be true, that's probably a good indication that you've over-optimized as well. Um, it needs to look somewhat similar to other systems uh, in, in this business, uh, I, I would say. Yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, that, that's the best because we, we talked about that last week or the week before where we were, one of the questions prompted us to sort of give some numbers that uh, typical drawdown would be twice the return or a multiple of the standard deviation. And, and uh, so we didn't want these systems to look too good. Uh, and if they're, if your max drawdown equals your average return, that maybe you have some issues there. And then another study that I had read last year and tweeted on was, um, I think it's something from Morningstar Research that said, but well, the characteristic of managers who outperformed or in the top 10% over a 20 or 30 year period was they had frequent periods where they underperformed. So you don't want a system that doesn't frequently underperform. <laughs> Doing the right thing is uh, going to put you in a situation where you're frequently going to uh, not look very good. Yeah, absolutely. Nick, thanks so much for your um, question. Very relevant, very good. Last question from today is from uh, Richard. Thanks so much, Richard, for getting back uh, this morning, actually, with your question. Um, even whilst you were watching your son play football, I understand, so that's perfect. Um, now, Richard has a question regarding um, distribution of returns from the underlying markets. Um, and I'm going to do my best to try to um, paraphrase uh, the question. But it goes uh, something along this, um, that it would appear that volatility targeting that uses a normal Gaussian distribution, which doesn't seem appropriate given the frequency of 10 plus standard deviation moves. This would seem to lead to silly comments like we saw a 15 standard devia deviation move last month. Uh, no, you didn't. You're just using the wrong distribution. So I think it's, I think the question is about, you know, whether the distribution um, analysis that we have been using um, in the past, whether they're still relevant, uh, given the fact that maybe some of these uh, moves or events in the markets have changed or become more frequent, if I understand it correctly. Um, maybe talk a little bit about that. Richard has a follow-up, a uh, couple of follow-up questions. Uh, he says, um, 
how meaningful uh, are those numbers in light of the um, uh, distribution of returns? Um, or is that just a question of trading smaller? Um, and on a related front, what would it take for you to think that that this might not work? I'm thinking that you're meaning trend following. Um, I understand that the priors would require a more a, a non-useful amount of or a more useful amount of date unconfirming data. But is there anything else that would cause you um, that would cause you to do that? Perhaps the future is different. Oh, okay, maybe. So the point is, is there something here? That, I mean, at what point do we may come to? Uh, may we come to the conclusion that maybe actually the future will be different from the past, and therefore we we should be more careful with using um, the methods that we've been using so far. I think something along those lines, Richard. Thanks for your question. I know it was difficult to um, get that typed out just right. So um, Jerry Moritz um, is. How do we think about these things? So at the risk of being a bit wrong on, the, on the answer sure. there, but um, <clears throat> of course, I mean, the, the future is going to be uh, looking different than the past. And yep. he had something about the normal distribution in there and, you know, financial returns, financial market returns not being normally distributed. That is well known, empirically observed. Um, uh, some of the models that are used in the root of space, they adjust for that. There may be, you know, other distributions. I mean, in statistics, there's, numerous distributions available and you may, you know, choose another one that fits the historical data better. Now, I also heard something about the vol controlling in that question. Is is that correct? I just want to say that even if, even if I had a perfect distribution, a distribution that was a great fit to the data that is observed in the past, I still wouldn't be doing any vol controlling um, on an ongoing basis. Why? Because it is an overlay to a trend following trading system and that whole controlling process has nothing to do with the trend following trading system. So I don't see that and I don't see why that would be a, a part of um, my trading style and my philosophy. So uh, I keep it in front of the gate, don't let it in the house. Um, and, and so that's why I said at, sure. at the risk of not covering the question completely, I'm not 100% sure what, um, what the exact question was. To be honest, Jerry, what are your what are your thoughts uh, about sort of changes in the, the way markets distribute their moves and how that may impact on the types of analysis conclusions we come to and and um, and the thing about uh, whether there comes a point where we may think that maybe things have changed enough for us to question um, our approaches. I think it's a concern. It's I was, uh, I was told this was a concern in 1983, and I was like, uh, "Wow, that's a shocker!" You know, why am I here? Uh, I was wondering, like, uh, the big risk in the markets uh, when I first went to Chicago in 1983 was that maybe trend following doesn't won't work anymore. So I think it's just an eternal thing that we always bring up. We we're, we're worried about it uh, anytime we have a bad period. I think uh, recently there hasn't been a lot of trends, uh, maybe just stocks mostly, not a lot of long trends. Um, I love my platinum trade or my <clears throat> emissions trade or something like that, but we need a few more of those nice long-term moves on the upside to make the historical money we've made. So I don't think that's probably going to get those trends, some, some more of those trends one of these days. Um, but I do. Th I am concerned that uh, the trend followers could uh, destroy their own trend following by the fall targeting, the crazy, chaotic, uh, indiscriminate buying and selling. If or if someone's doing it, it doesn't matter if it's the trend followers or not. It doesn't matter if it's fall targeting. When you put a lot, when you sit with the trade for one or two years, and then within a few days or weeks, the uh, massive crashes that happen in some of these markets due to a, a tremendous number uh selling or buying if it's a short uh this is bothersome this is i think going to kill the golden goose uh this is not a material part of the historical data 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, of course, um, uh, Richard, you're absolutely right. These are things that, you know, one needs to think about. Um, I, I mean, I've clearly markets have changed right from from the 70s when when we started or our founder started business to now clearly the markets have changed um has it stopped us from making uh the same or even better returns actually it hasn't uh, the improvements that we've made on our side uh, have certainly allowed us to keep up with with performance um and in you know to some degree maybe even improving our performance so i think um, yes, markets will change, and 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 I think also as 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 Jerry said, there there have been more examples of these flash crashes. I don't personally think that it's trend followers doing it. I think it could well as well be a lot of these um, passive funds that we now have that have to do their trading uh, within certain time frames every day to adjust for the inflows and the outflows and all of that. I think all of these things plus a lot of high frequency uh, trading firms as well. So. I think the answer is that we'll continue to to um, see markets change over time. The question is, can we each as individual firms find rules that are have broad enough shoulders to cater for these changes over time? And I think actually, to me, that is exactly what trend following is able to do because we recognize we're not trying to hit home runs all the time. Um, and and therefore we um, for long periods of time don't look very uh, sexy as a strategy, but I think that's also our strength. And I think as long as we can continue over a certain period of time, of course, to deliver what we um, you know what we have done in the, in the past, um, I think that's really how to 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 look at that. Now, as an industry, I will say that I can be a little bit concerned when I look at the numbers for the industry as a whole, because that hasn't done well, in particular in the last 10 years after the financial crisis and with all the intervention and zero, you know, zero interest rate policies and, and, and buybacks and all of those things. I do think maybe as an industry, um, things have changed. Um, but with any in, with, within any industry, of course, there are people who um, you know, deliver above average returns. And as any investors, and I know that's exactly what, what you're very good at, Richard, um, is to identify those managers. Um, you know, that's the job of any investor, really, um, because clearly you don't want to be average uh, and uh, and therefore you shouldn't necessarily benchmark against uh, just this the simple indices. But I think overall what I really truly like about uh what we do as trend followers is that we're not trying to to um yeah to come up with strategies that are suited for every single um you know change in in the markets but rather come up with some concepts and rules that are able to cater for um you know the longer term um, but i think it's a very relevant question so so we appreciate that um, those were the questions for today. Uh, let me just quickly update on performance uh, uh, from the early part of our conversation. It was clear that last week, maybe with the exception of, of Jerry, that it was a bit more difficult for trend followers. Um, so the BTOP50 index uh, is now down 2.24% uh, for the month of January and therefore for the year. Um, and this is as of Thursday. I do think maybe Friday, yesterday was bit of a quiet day but certainly a, a, a down week for for that um as well as for the other indices um the sock gen cta index down 2.47 percent for the month sock gen trend index down 3.6 percent for the month the sock gen short-term traders index down 0.91 percent for the month and the bridge alternatives the flat fee uh, manager index down 3.67 percent for the month so so far January is not looking great, but maybe we should um, be happy about that because last year, this time, January was looking fantastic and it turned out to be a really difficult year. So maybe this time it will be different. January will be tricky, but the rest of the year will be just, um, you know, rocking and rolling for trend followers. You never know. That would be nice. That would be nice. Um, anything else, uh, Jerry Moritz, on this, uh, on this January Saturday that you want to bring up? No, I think we're good. Um, wish everyone a good week ahead. Happy trading, happy skiing. 
Yes. <laughs> Good stuff. And of course, the three of us will meet up soon in Miami in a couple of weeks. If anyone of you listening is around, um, let us know. Maybe we could all meet up for a coffee or something a bit stronger. Um, so uh, on that note, we're going to wrap up this week's conversation. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we'd love uh, making them for you. Keep the questions coming. They are important. Uh, we think they add a lot of value to uh, to the series. Uh, and if you felt you got some value from today's conversation, please do share uh, these uh, episodes with your friends or own followers. Um, and of course, we would be ever so grateful if you would leave a rating and review on iTunes as it does help other investors discover the Systematic Investor Series. From Jerry Moritz and me, thanks so much for listening and we look forward to being back with you next week. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.